So this second afternoon presentation is going to be about the, the proposed or in development framework on PAMIs for cholera elimination. So earlier today, we were focusing on cholera control, those high to moderate transmission contexts. This afternoon, we'll be talking about the guidance that we are currently preparing. So it's not publicly released yet. You won't be able to find anything online, but this is our regular update on what the subgroup has been doing in thinking about PAMI guidance for cholera elimination. So uh, one, of the, uh, one of the goals of the roadmap to 2030 is for 20 countries to eliminate cholera. Uh, the sustainable elimination of cholera means that the national cholera plans should mit mitigate vulnerabilities in the reestablishment of cholera transmission. And so one of the reasons we cannot use the same guidance uh, for, for cholera control and for cholera elimination is because ideally, if you are preparing a national cholera plan that is going to achieve elimination within a uh, you know, five to eight year time frame. you already are at a point where there are very few cholera cases being reported. And so prioritizing places according to previous incidents, previous persistence, there, there aren't, isn't going to be enough case data reported to actually do the prioritization in a meaningful way. So here we're really thinking about vulnerabilities in the reestablishment of cholera transmission as factors for identifying priority areas. So this is a diagram you've seen now a few times. This morning we were focusing on the high to moderate transmission areas. This blue guidance is what we currently have published on the website, which is PAMIs for cholera control. This session is focusing on the right-hand column here. So those countries where there's low to no recent transmission, and we would be identifying priority areas according to risk of reestablishment uh, and creating a priority index based on vulnerability factors. And eventually this guidance will be placed in a similar location uh, and will be called PAMIs for cholera elimination. So when should we be using this method? Again, this is going to be towards the beginning of an NCP inception period, but for a country that is, per, is getting close to caller elimination status. And the indicative rule on when this guidance should be used is just the opposite of what we discussed this morning. So it should be used in countries where cholera outbreaks were reported in less than 5% of geographic units over at least the five past uh, years. So this is currently in development, but I'm gonna talk about some of the general principles and where we're going with this guidance. So we have a very, very similar setup with what we did for PAMIs for cholera control. The first step will again be preparation of data sets. This is pretty standard. We should be specifying the geographic scale of analysis, determining the analysis period, and gathering the necessary data as, as is before. Some, this, this slide has not been updated correctly, but the uh, priority index score will be uh, using vulnerability factor indicators. So ignore that epi and test positivity indicators there. Um, there will be vulnerability factors. And again, it will be scoring a multi-dimensional priority index. And the last step, the third step is the all important stakeholder validation, where we will be building stakeholder consensus on the PAMIs that have been identifying, identified and validating that final list. So these are the three main steps we'll always be following. In the preparation of data sets, uh, data sets we, we will be defining the administrative unit and analysis period and identifying country-specific vulnerability factors. So what do we mean by that? Vulnerability is uh, something that can be defined in many different ways. And in order to ground the motivation for 
including certain factors, we thought it would be useful to link it to different outbreak phases. So what do I mean when I say outbreak phase? So in the first phase of an outbreak, we can think about introduction of toxigenic Vibrio cholera 01 or 0139 from a cholera affected area into a new geographic unit. So the idea is vulnerability factors that are linked to introduction of cholera into a new location. The second phase of an outbreak we can think about is onset. So take the takeoff of the outbreak in the community. So here we're thinking about vulnerability factors that would be linked to local cholera transmission within a specific geographic unit, or we can also say the local development of the outbreak. And then the third phase that we're thinking about is broader amplification and spread. So spread of the outbreak to multiple geographic units. So when we're deciding which vulnerability factors we think are important for this priority index, we should be able to link them to at least one of these outbreak phases. Is it a factor that is affecting potential introduction, onset, or spread of the outbreak in order to justify its inclusion in the index? So we have a, an indicative list of vulnerability factors here, which are we're saying are the non-wash related factors. And in each row, we have a, a different factor, which is basically a yes or no presence or absence type of um, information. And on the right-hand side, we're, we're kind of showing an example of how those vulnerability factors are tied to specific epidemic phases. So for example, uh, major population gatherings, which is in the fourth row, is we, we might think of that as being linked to the introduction of an outbreak, whereas uh, something like areas at high risk for extreme climate and weather conditions, maybe that's something that's more linked to onset and diffusion or, or broader spread of the outbreak. So this is not necessarily the same in all places, or, or this is really just to provide an example of how we can think we can be thinking about deciding which vulnerability factors are selected. And of course, this will vary by context, by country, and by context. Um, but here we have a list of vulnerability factors that we think could be somewhat generalizable to many different countries. So. Um, locations that are adjacent to cross-border cholera affected areas, uh, locations along major travel routes and transportation hubs, um, areas with high population density or high-risk populations, um, and areas affected by complex humanitarian emergencies. So, so these are all different types of factors that we could be thinking about. I also wanted to, to draw your attention to this cholera outbreak in the past five years. So this is getting back to that original indicative rule of whether we should be following the cholera control or the cholera elimination guidance. So here, if, you're, if you had a cholera outbreak in the past five years, this is clearly a vulnerability to cholera because you demonstrably had a cholera outbreak there recently. The other set of factors that we, of course, need to consider are related to WASH, and we felt that we needed a little bit more complexity in the way that the WASH indicators were considered. So here um, on the right-hand side, I'm showing the, the ladder for the Joint Monitoring Program's WASH category. So for each of these three categories, drinking water, sanitation, and hand washing, there are a standard set of questions and data that, that get collected asking about different levels of uh, access to these facilities. So whether there's surface only surface water usage, unimproved, limited, basic, or safely managed access to drinking water. And um, what we consider to be the high risk categories for disease or the, the places that are most vulnerable would have a high proportion of the population living in places that have surface water usage and 
um, unimproved water uh, access or unimproved sanitation and um, high proportion of the population using open defecation or no hand washing facilities. So we'll be coming back to these high risk categories in the way that we define how wash factors are incorporated in the priority index. So uh, there's a lot of text here, but this is a brief summary of how we're thinking about using these factors. So for example, in the water, the water access related factor, a population might be considered vulnerable if more than 30% of the population is using an unimproved water facility type or below. So thinking about this as a hierarchical ladder in both the unimproved and surface water categories. So 30% of the population is in one of those two categories or below, or if more than 15% of the population is in the lowest category, which is the surface usage of surface water. Um, we have a somewhat similar metric proposed for the sanitation uh, factor. So if more than 50% of the population is using an unimproved sanitation facility type or below, or more than 30% of the population is practicing open defecation. And then for the third hygiene related factor, uh, it's a little bit more simple where um, it would be a vulnerability factor if more than 50% of the population had no hand washing facility on premises. These were factors that were developed in consultation with um, the WASH working group. And so this is something we've, we've thought about a little bit and, and tried to incorporate feedback. So now we have uh, different vulnerability factor scores and we'll be using them to calculate a priority index. So for each NCP operational unit, the vulnerability factors that are not WASH related are quite simple to score. There's either one point if that factor is present, zero points if absent. For the three WASH related indicators, we have that more complex uh, calculation of, of access within the population, but if the indicator is equal or greater than that cutoff value, you get one point and zero points if it's below. So it's a very simple binary calculation of presence absence or greater than the cutoffs or below the cutoffs. And so each factor is getting weighted equally with one point. And the priority index is the sum of all of these different uh, scores. So the last and final step is the stakeholder validation. Um, this should already be relatively familiar. So the same kind of format, a participative workshop with multi-sectoral stakeholders, where this is slightly different. We'll, we, we'll be validating the list of vulnerability factors that are included, um, as that is something that could be subject to change by country. There's also the, the same step as in the PAMI control guidance where there needs to be an agreement on the priority index threshold value above which all of the locations would be designated a PAMI. And then finally, there's the development of consensus on the final list. So we have here a more simplified diagram of the summary of the steps. For each NCP operational unit, you'll have a single priority index value. If there's been a cholera outbreak in the past five years, automatically that location will be considered a PAMI under this elimination type guidance. Because again, we're, we're sort of thinking that historical cholera burden is a strong indicator of potential future cholera burden and you know these there shouldn't be too many places that fall into this category when you are using this guidance because you should be aiming for elimination at this point on the other side so if there hasn't been a cholera outbreak in the past 5 years then in order to prioritize those remaining locations we would be looking at the priority index value and selecting all locations above the, the selected threshold. 
and those that are above the, the, the threshold go into the final list of PAMIs. Those that are below are not considered PAMIs. So it's a, a slightly more simple scoring and um, triaging type of step for the elimination factors. And, and part of the reasoning is that we're trying to, to make things simpler and uh, have it be a more straightforward and data-driven process. So as I mentioned, this is a, a guidance that is still under development. We have been able to pilot this in Mali, and we'll hear from Dr. Jose Pum just afterwards, I believe, who will talk about Mali's experience with a previous version of this guidance. And we'll also be continuing to write up the document and provide similar supporting materials. So a similar Excel type tool, as well as training materials that will accompany. And uh, that's it for this presentation. Again, I'd like to thank the subgroup members who have provided feedback on this process, as well as the pilot countries. And I'm happy to take any questions. There is a question from uh, Abhishek online. Hi, thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth, for, for this um, uh, presentation about the elimination. I am slightly confused uh, regarding, uh, regarding this because what I have understood, like many countries in their national cholera control plan are also aiming to be among those 20 countries who are aiming for elimination as such. Uh, but those countries are definitely in a in a range which is not satisfying this PAMI for elimination because they are having uh, more than five percent of their geographical units in in with the cholera cases. So in those cases, like is this an advice coming from GTFCC, like the countries with more than five percent uh, cholera cases? should uh, better uh, try for a national cholera control plan rather than an elimination plan. So, so if, we, if a clarity can be given on this, it will be helpful. Thank you. Thanks for the question. I think this is a really good point to clarify. So yes, if, if your country is not meeting the criteria of uh, five, what is it now, 5% of units, um, that have had not had cholera in at least the last five years, we should be following the PAMI's guidance for cholera control. And the idea is not that a country should not aim for elimination if they are following the cholera control guidance, but NCPs are typically going over a five-year period, and uh, we don't think it will necessarily be feasible to achieve elimination in five years if you're still in a high to moderate transmission setting. And so the idea is a phased uh, mechanism for getting to that prioritization. Maybe after one round or two rounds of NCPs that are prioritizing PAMIs according to cholera control, eventually the country will move to the elimination guidance. So it's more about thinking about the of the operational uh, time frame on which the planning is occurring and which guidance should be followed for that operational time frame. Jackie. Thanks, Elizabeth. No? Oh, good. Okay. Um, thank you for that. Um, as you talked about the issue of missing sort of test positivity data earlier, how do we apply this tool if we don't have good sort of wash coverage or access data? This is um, something I think will come up in the Molly presentation later, but yeah, I, I think we're still thinking through what the appropriate mechanism for that might be. Um, in some of the, the countries where we've informally piloted, 
there might be multiple sources of wash data, maybe at the province level, which isn't necessarily the operational level. And then there might be some estimates that are of higher resolution in other places. So there's obviously going to be a lot of difficulty, I think, in having standardized wash data. And so, I mean, I think either trying to assume that the higher level data applies to those operational units might be the best thing we can do at the moment. But I think this is something that we still have to work on as a subgroup. So one of the next steps to add. In the back. Thank you very much. So in your document, you have this uh, first phase where you have introduction and then you have the onset and then the spread. Is there a place also to have a fourth uh, phase, the exit of the outbreak or no? So how we can tell that this is the exit of the outbreak? If you have only three, you have introduction uh, and, and onset and spread. Sorry, what was the last, what was the fourth phase that you were proposing? So in your outbreak phases, so you have the first one, introduction, and then you have the, uh, the onset of the outbreak, and then you have the spread of the outbreak to other areas. So is there also room towards this uh, different phase to add a fourth, a fourth one about the exit of the outbreak, the end of the outbreak? Because it's not easy to, 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 to reach this end of the outbreak. So we need to have also indicators uh, related to the end of the outbreak. I see. So the goal of that framework is to think about how we can, sorry, I'm trying to go back, but I think this isn't working. Um, the, the goal of, of that framework is to think about how we should be selecting which vulnerability factors are included in the priority index. So having factors associated with exiting the outbreak may not necessarily be helping with how to prioritize which locations are um, you know, highest priority for intervention. So really that framework is thinking about how do we motivate the selection of the vulnerability factors by linking it to a specific phase which propagates disease transmission. Yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, as you know that Emru is a unique, uh, Eastern Mediterranean region is a unique region. Uh, for instance, this year we uh, suffered from cholera outbreak in Lebanon and Syria after 30 years of absence. So which tool of them, either the endemic or the this one with the elimination phase, will give us a reliable data in identifying the areas uh, which needs uh, to be targeted with the interventions? Given that we have a data for uh, one year, data for cases, for the positivity, uh, for the case fatality and mortality. So which one will give us a reliable um, indication about the areas that need to be targeted? I think for places that have had large recent outbreaks, we should be trying to use the cholera control guidance, but it's true that we are recommending hopefully five to 15 years of data for that analysis period. I think when there are not, when there isn't enough historical data, we'll have to just rely on the data that's available. I don't know if, if anyone wants to, else wants to comment on that question. I think it's a really good point because we are seeing some countries that have had reemergence after a relatively tranquil period. And I think though that in these situations, would we should be trying to focus on analyzing the the actual surveillance data that we have, and so that's why I would would go with the cholera control guidance. Are there any other questions? A question from uh, Rachel online from IFRC. Over to you, Rachel. Thank you. I couldn't unmute. Sorry. Um, thank you very much for the presentation. Just a quick follow-up question, and apologies if I missed this in the introduction. Um, but I'm wondering about the planning in terms of dissemination of this information um, and also of the results. 
um, moving forward in the future, if that will be part of the GTFCC platform um, so that we can have kind of one-stop shop for, for all of this information or if it will still be country by country. Thanks. I'm not sure I quite understood the question. Do you mean the, the guidance documents or do you mean the results of the analyses that would be produced? I, sorry, I can't unmute myself. Um, the results, absolutely the results. Um, it's been an extreme challenge this past year um, to get results of anything in one place. So I'm curious if that will be part of the goal um, moving forward to, to have this as part of the GTFCC platform to have the results there. Um, I'm I'm not quite sure about the answer to that question. I mean, I think in terms of monitoring and evaluation purposes, of course, it's very helpful to have all of the results of the PAMI analyses in a single place. I don't know if Philippe or Morgan, you want to comment on on that at all. Uh, there will be a discussion session this afternoon about the next steps, the way forward, including from a coordination standpoint with regard to the global roadmap. And I think this is one of the questions we will discuss extensively after the coffee break, actually. And I'm not sure what the answer will be, but it will be discussed for sure. Great. Are there any other questions or comments? Yes. So previous history of five years of cholera uh, is something that can guide you. Do you consider this as endemic? First thing, if five years of consecutive, you know, recurrent cholera occurs, maybe that, that place is endemic. So if we know about the all the endemic <coughs> places and also... <clears throat> considering the disasters, the war, and other things like in war in Ukraine. So definitely pe people are displaced and infrastructure of safe drinking water is destroyed. So there will be an outbreak. So these are the things that need to be considered. And one most important thing to me, I don't know if it is relevant here, uh, that, I mean, can we target the hotspots where actually cholera comes from. I mean, the places that seed, the seeding places, like cholera is not, you know, present in every places at a given time, but you can find some places that are basically having cholera around the year, or maybe, you know, very uh, commonly, you know, found like in Africa or in Asia, like in Bangladesh, India. So I can tell you one example. The man sitting behind, beside me is a WHO Indian representative. He might know. I was visiting the cholera affected villages of India, the, uh, the Odisha. So I visited the villages and saw that the hotspots were kind of sealed up by, you know, uh, developing the water supply facility there. So there was, people used to use surface water, but now you can see that pipes are connected to every household to supply water. So you can really find cholera there basically. But cholera is there in Kolkata. Maybe there are some slums and some crowded places having lit, lit, little safe water access and hygiene is also poor. So those are the places like in Dhaka, uh, it has already been mentioned by many, many. These are the crowded places and they have all the cholera bacteria present around the year. So if those places could be kind of improved, supply water and other work, other way. So you could like, you know, you could stop the transmission. So if there is a seeding place that will definitely 
you know, seed the other places under kind of circumstance like natural disaster or maybe war or any other you know situation so this these are the things probably need to be also considered in the action control plan basically thank you thanks for the comment so I just want to clarify, so this guidance and specifically this diagram that we have up here is really for uh, con transmission contexts where there should be relatively few places that have had a cholera outbreak within the past five years. So if we're talking about endemic transmission in multiple places, we should really be thinking about the cholera control guidance and not the cholera elimination guidance. But I agree with your point that, you know, there are many vulnerability factors that we need to be taking into consideration and um, overcrowded settings and high density populations are some of the factors that we have included in the indicative list here. Are there any other questions or comments? If... Uh, uh, ju just to support what you 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 uh, you were saying, Elizabeth, I think seems a good. Gentlemen, it's for you the answer. Uh, so the the um, I think what is very important uh, is also to uh, to try really to understand what are these tools made for. Okay, so the thing is. Uh, we will not be able to uh, identify at least uh, and answer all the risk. Okay, so uh, you know the, the 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 factors that you were mentioning. Uh, you know, yes, war can start. Uh, cholera can be exported from many other countries that are not yet affected. Okay, so people are traveling. So uh, the example of Syria and Lebanon, but also recently uh, it's what in South Africa is a good example of country that have, uh, you know, controlled sustainably cholera for years. The objective, and especially in the context where you are working, India and Bangladesh, is really where to put most resources, reduce the incidence. The more people, country are doing that, so, so that will reduce the global risk because this is also uh, you know, uh, you know, there, where is the chicken and the egg? Uh, uh, so if there is a global reduction of the incidence of cholera, then the risk of exportation to new area will, will, uh, uh, will also reduce. Of course, there is no re uh, zero risk. So I think for the guidance are not made uh, for predicting <laughs> what will happen in five years in terms of political conflict and war in another part of the world, but at least to address the, the, the problem uh, uh, that we have now. So I think what is really important during these four days, uh, two and a, three and a half now, uh, is really to try to focus on the, uh, the general principle. Uh, and then after we'll work on the details, but I think the, the, uh, it's really important to uh, to try to see, and we need your insight on how you will adapt, apply this tool to your own specific context. I mean, the things that are going to be developed can only be generic. Uh, and after, I mean, devil is in details, it's really to adapt the generic to the specific and to include, you know, specific, uh, because it's the same for WASH, okay? So if we just take WASH as an indicator, then you have a third of the world that that is a cholera potential hotspot i mean you know so there is no prioritization so we need to prioritize to show it's feasible and that will have an impact on other hotspot for the disease etc cetera, etc cetera. so start small <laughs> Poor hygiene is not an option basically Poor hygiene is just like, you know, when a person from coastal area of Bangladesh is displaced because his homeland and his petty grounds are all inundated by uh, salt water. So the family is almost like, you know, forced to leave the, uh, the, the village home and end up in the, you know, slum in Dhaka city. So you can, you can understand the struggle, kind of struggle they face when they, you know, uh, enter into the city 
of all the you know things that we are talking about the hygiene war safe water and blah 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 so basically to them accessing food is the priority not the hygiene not the wash Ex drinking accessing drinking water is something that matters to them not the quality of water so i'm um, these these are the things like otherwise i mean to me it might like not be kind of how to say like i mean treating a disease and preventing is different things you know so we should be trying to this is i think this is the right forum to say where to where to go and say that actually we need to eliminate the you know transmission eliminate the bacteria not like treating superficially applying vaccine and blah 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 to just help them after the infection after the outbreak after thousands of people died you know we are mobilizing everything but we have to focus more on i i, I thought this is the right forum to share my it might like you know anyway thank you oh, just to add a point since he mentioned that uh, of course the pipe supply and uh, sewage systems the health system infrastructure uh, definitely where it improves there's a dramatic uh, control for cholera cases but where it does not uh, we do still see the outbreaks happening yeah. and more so in india where there are large gatherings like you have these melas yeah, yeah. etc they put up temporary tents and then they bring the water uh, etc and that's where you see uh, sometimes mixing of sewage and water supply and the cholera is more just to add to the context of what he said but infrastructure wise there has been a lot of improvement and cholera has come down uh, dramatically but in certain places it's also increased in in outbreaks just to add uh we all take one last question in the back thank you very much it's rather a comment Cholera for us means that you have problems with the water system. And if you only treat cholera, you will not solve the problem. We've got vaccine for cholera in Lebanon this last year. So numbers have decreased because we have some protection of the vaccine. But we didn't solve the problem of the water. So I'm thinking that maybe in some coming months we have another wave of cholera because I didn't treat my water system. I think that when we treat that water system, you will prevent cholera, but also other diseases like hepatitis A and other and others. So I think that we have to put in the plan some, some place where we have to work on the risk factors, especially for the water system and water safety. Over. Thanks for the comment. I think we're I think we're all in agreement that there needs to be more than just vaccination campaigns implemented in PAMIs. And certainly in this elimination context, we should be focusing on water and sanitation and other, other things that are going to be you know, improving surveillance um, rather than vaccination. Because at this point, those are the things that are going to sustain the color-free status that might be attained by this country. So really, I think we're all in agreement that we need to have multi-sectoral interventions as a response to the development of an NCP. So um, we're going to move on to the next session now. So this is a, a presentation of the pilot work that has been done in Mali. So the, the PAMIs for cholera elimination was tested um, in Mali with the collaboration of Dr. Jose Pum, who will be presenting on the Mali experience. Uh, I believe the presentation will be in French. So for those of you that want the translation, please get your headsets ready. And um, over to you, Dr. Pham. Uh, 